Okay. Um, let me say, first of all, on behalf of Kelsey and Saeed, that we appreciate the chance to share our research with you this morning, and we appreciate your attention and interest in the findings. I do recognize that the, the noon hour is quickly approaching. I'll try and be as efficient as I can getting through this message. It is a message that takes us back to nitrogen, but this time the focus is on the long-term impact on the soil itself. Uh, it's a message that I could not possibly have given you early in my career because I didn't understand it. I had never been taught any of this in any class I took, and I never taught it. And it was only through working with Saeed and Tim Ellsworth that I gained the understanding I'll give you today. Tim is now in California, so he has his own problems to deal with. <laughs> um, I should also acknowledge help and collaboration by Charlie Bost uh, on some of the work I'll talk about and uh, excellent statistical support from Susanna Reff. So the modern era of industrialized agriculture got its start over 100 years ago with the industrial synthesis of ammonia from nitrogen and air. It's the subject of this book by a geographer named Yaakov Schmiel. He's at the University of Manitoba. And in the quote that I have extracted in the box on the left, he is telling us that the synthesis of ammonia was the most important technological advance of the 20th century because it's the development that gave rise to a doubling of world population. Well, I wouldn't take exception with his view on the importance of this development, but I do question his title. His book is entitled Enriching the Earth, but maybe by the end of my story, you'll think it's the wrong title too. So let's talk a little bit about ammonia synthesis. And I put here the reaction that converts N2 gas and air into ammonia. Ammonia is highly reactive, N2 is highly inert. That's why it makes up most of air. And so to get this conversion to proceed, it's necessary to have a high temperature, a high pressure, and the right catalyst. And believe me, those requirements at the time this was done were groundbreaking challenges. No industry had ever operated at those conditions. So the process was first successfully demonstrated in a lab in Karlsruhe, Germany by a guy named Fritz Haber. Haber was a young assistant professor. He had been trained in organic chemistry and now he was working on ammonia synthesis. He gave a demonstration in his lab on July 2nd of 1909. And to it, he invited representatives from BASF. BASF, which was the largest chemical company in the world, had planned to invest in nitrogen fixation through the electric arc process in Norway, where they have a lot of hydroelectric power. But when, when Haber demonstrated that he could make ammonia on a small scale, the next day, BASF canceled their investment in Norway. They had seen the future of nitrogen fixation. And from there, they faced the challenge of upscaling the process to make an industry. That called for a tremendous investment and a lot of technical capabilities from a group led by Carl Bosch. They had to overcome some daunting challenges. 
But they did, and the first ammonia plant opened in Germany, came on stream at Oppau in 1913. The intention had been to use the output to make fertilizer in the form of ammonium sulfate. But those plans were, were overthrown by the developments of August 1914 and the beginning of World War I. And so the output stream was redirected toward making ammonium nitrate and TNT. And it is said that if Germany had not had ammonia synthesis, World War I would have ended by December of 1914. The Germans would have run out of artillery shells. Well, they didn't run out, and millions paid the price for that development. Of course, the importance was even greater in World War II that followed, beginning in 1939. And yet, in the US, we still farmed in the classical sense of growing corn after a forage legume like alfalfa or sweet clover. So we see it pictured here even into the very early 1960s. This was still the method of farming. Ammonia had not made its way to the corn belt, but it was about to. After World War II, the munitions plants needed a new market for their product. And of course, that was agriculture. And so by the, by the 1960s, getting into the mid and later part of the 1960s, the white tanks were showing up in the fields, and anhydrous ammonia was now being used as a principal end source that farmers could now buy instead of growing it with legumes. It changed everything including the landscape of Illinois in the Midwest. And so we look at the effects of what we've seen in the past 70 years. And here we're looking at statewide average corn yield data for Illinois. And we see a tremendous upward climb in those yields. It's one of agriculture's great success stories. So that on land that used to grow 50 bushels an acre, farmers are now routinely growing 200 or more. The reasons for that increase are many, as you know, probably better than I do. Genetics play a huge role, management practices, but nitrogen fertilizers get a lot of the credit. If we want to understand how much of this is due to, nit to nitrogen, we need to take another look and ask the question whether corn yield has followed nitrogen usage. That's what we're doing with this figure, again showing data for Illinois. This time we've put two plots here. One would be the input of fertilizer nitrogen, and the other would be the removal in corn grain. So the input increased dramatically as we went into the 1960s, and the crossover point came in 1965 for the state as a, as a whole, that from that time on, more nitrogen was being applied as fertilizer than was being removed in the grain. The increase was dramatic as we went into the 1970s and 80s. And by the early 1980s, the amount of fertilizer in applied was over twice as much as what was removed in the grain. Farmers had found an insurance policy, and at that time, it was pretty economical. More recently, nitrogen fertilizer rates have tended to level off a bit. There have been ups and downs, depending upon weather and markets and so forth. But it kind of flattened out until I just saw in the last few days, updating my database, 
until 19, until 2020. In 2020, there was a tremendous increase in statewide average end rates up to over 250 pounds per acre. So I wondered, well, what, what motivated that? And the best I could tell was prices. Nitrogen was down in 2020, and the markets were favorable for corn. That changed in 2021 with much higher end prices. But the point we're asking in the question for this slide is whether corn yield has followed end rates. And the answer I hope you can see is no. Corn yields have fairly steadily risen over the years with ups and downs, whereas nitrogen has, has not led the way. And as we look at the tail end of the figure on the right side, we see that for some years, corn has removed more in than was applied, or in, in the recent past, last three years, we've applied much more in than the corn needed. So if the corn yield hasn't followed the fertilizer N rates, it must stand to reason that there's another source of N because growing higher yields does indeed take more N. Well, there is another source, and it's the soil. And we find out from this figure, as Kelsey was telling us in her presentation, that the soil is usually the main source of N, not the fertilizer. Here we're looking at a summary of response yields. These are nitrogen response trials done on farm. 47 of these that had not been manured for at least three years before they were studied. And I give you stacked bars here with the green part of the bar, if you can make that out, being the check yield, unfertilized. And the blue bars stacked onto the, onto the green represent the additional increment of yield coming from the economically optimum end rate of fertilizer. Now there are, there are 11 of these 47 bars that have no blue bar. Those are the cases where there was no statistically significant effect of N and fertilizer on corn yield. They were non-responsive. So the green bars and the data are arranged so that the, the green bars decrease from left to right. And if you look at the blue bars, they tend to increase toward the right side as the green bars are decreasing. It's an important point that Kelsey brought out in her talk that poor soils need more fertilizer in and good soils need less. Now for this set of 47 sites, I give you the numbers in the box, and we find out that on average, the yield increase with N was 42 bushels an acre, and it came from 85 pounds of N per acre. 85 pounds. I think most farmers use a little bit more than 85 pounds. And the textbooks would tell us that's a good thing. Because by increasing yields, nitrogen fertilizers also increase the input of residues. And those extra residues can help build organic matter. If the textbooks are right, then Illinois soils are better than they used to be in a lot of properties that matter for growing crops. Things like soil aggregation and aeration. Water availability and infiltration. Cation exchange and buffer capacities the supply of mineralizable NPNS, 
the supply of micronutrients, and many more functions besides these. There's plenty of evidence that nitrogen fertilizers do build organic matter. And one example is shown in this figure. It comes from a study done at Monmouth in Western Illinois on some continuous corn plots. And it's showing us soil organic carbon sequestration rates as a function of nitrogen fertilizer rate. The work was done with sampling the soil from the surface foot or down to three feet. And so we have two sets of data here. But we notice that in both cases, there's a positive slope indicating that more N gave more soil organic carbon. Well, our problems are solved. <laughs> but before we celebrate, let's take note that there's no point for the check plot. There's no data for the zero rate. And the reason is that the other rates are being compared to the zero. So all these plots were sampled at the same time and just one time. And the implicit assumption is that the check plot was constant over time. And we can compare the fertilized plots to the check. Well, I'm here to tell you that's, that's not the way it is. When you farm a soil and put nothing back, you, are, you have a mining operation. That soil is getting poorer and weaker and it's losing organic matter. So in this case, although the fertilized soil, when they were sampled at the same time as the check, had higher organic carbon levels, it's possible that over time, they had lost organic matter instead of gaining. And indeed, that turns out to be exactly the case. Because we have a second data set from the same plots collected 10 years earlier. And there we find out that when we average the plots for all those different end rates, we've lost over two tons of SOC per acre in the surface four inches. We didn't gain, we lost. So the figure in the previous slide inverted reality. Well, maybe the problem is that 10 years isn't long enough. Maybe we just need more time. If so, being at the University of Illinois brings us the perfect opportunity to check it out. We have the moral plots, the oldest cropping experiment in North America. Started in 1876. It's been farmed every year and it supports three rotations, continuous corn in the north, what is now a corn soybean rotation in the center, used to be corn oats until 1967, and on the south end, we have corn, oats, and alfalfa hay. Now beginning in 19, oh by the way, this site was designated in 1968 as a National Historic Landmark. It's a really good thing that happened uh, because the university can't touch the land. And I know that university well enough to know they would build something on it or pave it over as a parking lot if they could, but they can't. So soils have a way of accumulating the evidence of how they've been managed. 
It's exactly what's happened here. So beginning in 1955, they began to bring in commercial fertilizer to selected parts of the Moro plots. And by the way, this whole set of plots is now on an area of about seven tenths of an acre. So these are small plots. So the fertilizer came in in 1955. And in 1956, there was an article published by the guy who was at that time the head of the Department of Agronomy. His name was M.B. Russell. The title is All the Way Back in One Year. And it was extolling the great achievement here of boosting corn yields with just one year of NPK. It had restored the productivity of what had been an unfertilized check plot. What they did was to split the check plot in 1955. Half of it remained unfertilized. The other half got NPK. And it stayed that way ever since. So this is telling us that the yields had been dramatically increased with NPK all the way back in one year. Well, the good news continued in 1982 with another publication on the moral plots. This one subtitled A Century of Learning. And Saeed, I'm looking at you because I know your subtitle is A Century of Lying. So we'll, we'll bear that in mind. In this publication, they have a figure. This is for continuous corn and they're plotting the change in organic matter over the years from, actually from 1904 up to that time until 73. And it's of greatest interest to notice this lowest set of data in the figure. Right here. That was the old unfertilized check plot. And when they were mining it with no input, it was losing organic matter. But according to this figure, in 1955, when half of the plot began to get NPK, now we notice there's a linear uptick, uptick in organic matter. It's linear. Well, that kind of got our attention after Saeed brought this matter to my attention. And we thought, well, why don't we resample the moral plots? Time is on our side. 51 years later. So I just extrapolate out here, and we should be seeing an increase in organic matter of 12 tons per acre with the NPK plots, or for organic carbon, that would be about seven tons an acre. So we're looking for the increase when we sampled in 2005 and compared it to the archive samples collected in 1955. That's what we're doing. Well, this always reminds me of the old Wendy's commercial, Where's the Beef? You get a big bun, but a small patty. Well, where's the buildup? A um, couple photos on this figure, taken one year at harvest. We have the check plot here in the northwest corner of continuous corn. There were only 8,000 plants an acre, and there's so little residue that you can easily see the bare soil. Right next to it, we have the NPK with 32,000 plants per acre, four times the population, lots of residue. You can't see the soil. So I have walked by the moral plots countless times, and I, like anyone else, would assume, well, that NPK soil must have more carbon in it because it has so much more residue. Well, I was the one who did the carbon analysis, so I can attest to this. 
In the bar chart, we're looking at the input of carbon over those 51 years, and we find out that it's like three times greater for the NPK with those 32,000 plants than for the Czech with 8,000. No surprise. The surprise is in the soil. And there we find that over those 51 years between 1955 and 2005, the Czech plot had gained a little bit in soil organic carbon down to 18 inches, whereas the NPK lost. Now that's pretty striking to me. And of course I began to wonder, now what's going on here? Are the frat boys stealing the residues? What's happening here? No, there was a different thief at work. It was in the soil and we call it the microbes. We go to corn soybean in the center part of the moral plots, we see the same story. Here we have about double the input of residue carbon with NPK, but we have a loser. It's not in the soil. So the check plot lost and so did the NPK. It's telling me that I might put all those residues into the soil, but I can't keep the carbon. That's what's going on. I look on the nitrogen side of the story. I see the same thing. So most of the nitrogen in soils is tied up in organic matter. Kelsey talked about that. So if carbon is lost, you would think nitrogen would be too. And sure enough, it was. Here we're looking at the change in nitrogen over those 51 years, comparing the check to the NPK. The check had no input of nitrogen. It lost nitrogen, and who would be surprised? It was being mined. But the NPK had over double the N applied as what was removed, and it lost even more than the check. Just imagine this. You're, you're applying all this nitrogen to your soil, and you're losing nitrogen from the soil. This is, this is not a bank account, as I was taught in, in some of my earlier life. It doesn't work that way because the microbes don't play by those rules. We look at the corn soybean story, it's the same. We put nitrogen fertilizer in, we lose nitrogen from the soil. We can't hold it. And then we come back and look at the soil's mineralizable end content. This ties back to the Illinois soil end test that Kelsey talked about. And we compare for the NPK subplots, 1955 and 2005, and with all three rotations, we've lost. In other words, the soil is weaker than it used to be. We've changed it. And as Saeed pointed out to me, it's so interesting that on Davenport Hall, down near the Union, we have the quotation by Draper that the wealth of Illinois is in her soil. And here in the moral plots, we find out we've squandered the wealth. So of course we began to wonder, is this unique to the moral plots or has it been seen elsewhere? So Said and I did quite a bit of library work on this topic. And the first place we thought to go to was the oldest experimental site in the world. That would be at Rothamsted near London, England. There, 
The work was started in 1842. And by the way, I might just add the comment, Rothamsted is the home to the fertilizer industry. That's where it started. So 1842, and here's a set of data in this figure, spanning just about a century. And we're looking at organic carbon in the topsoil, which to them is nine inches. Plotted over these years, we compare farmyard manure, NPK, and the unmanured, which is the check, unfertilized. This is under continuous wheat on the broad bar plots. Pretty obvious, farmyard manure was a builder and NPK was not. They're losing. They don't want to admit it, but they're losing. And up in the box in the upper left-hand corner, I have the nitrogen story. It's the same as the carbon. Farmyard manure increased, NPK lost. We go to another long-term site in Europe. This one's in Denmark, the Askoff site. They're farming two soils there, one a sand, one a loam. They have a mixed crop rotation, and I give you the end rate down here. It is 70 kilograms per hectare per year, and in both cases, over time, about 50 years here, they're losing organic matter. And they're losing nitrogen. By the way, the manure treatment at this site lost, whereas Rothamsted gained because the manure rate here was much lower than at Rothamsted. Then we go to France with the Grignon plots. They're growing wheat and sugar beet. We have here 20 years of data. Same story. Soil organic carbon is down, and so is total in. Soil is getting weaker. Now let's come back to the U.S. with the Sanborn Field at Columbia, Missouri. The second oldest set of plots in this country. They were started in 1888. But the Sanborn Field guys got the jump on the Moral Plots boys. Because right from the beginning, they had a treatment with nitrogen fertilizer. The fertilizer was ammonium sulfate. Well, after the first 25 years in 1914, they had taken samples and kept those samples, stored in an archive. And then there was a guy who, who went to Missouri after getting four degrees at Illinois, and you may have heard of this guy, William Albrecht. He spent most of his career as the department chair at Missouri. In 1938, he published two articles that are pertinent to this topic. The first one was in the year, was in the USDA handbook, Soils and Men. And in there, he gave the party line that in order to build soil organic matter, you must apply nitrogen because organic matter contains nitrogen. It's like baking a cake. But then he went and sampled Sanborn Field after the second 25 years. <laughs> and what he found totally changed his view. It's depicted by the figure. So he's looking at continuous wheat, comparing the first 25 and the second 25. Soil organic carbon here, total N here. The check plot had gained organic carbon, and the NVK had lost. They both lost on total N. 
Elbrick came to realize something's going on here. And in his paper, he gives this quote, that it's the NPK plots that were lowest in organic matter. And it's because the carbon had been burned out. It's right in the paper. The fire he's referring to is not from matches, it's from microbes. The microbes are using the nitrogen and it stimulates them. And we come here against a fundamental principle of life on planet Earth that always links carbon and nitrogen. It's summarized here in this slide. Most of the microbes that live in soil do the same thing that we do. They use organic carbon to make energy, as well as biomass. In order to use that carbon, they need to build the enzymes that catalyze its destruction. And every enzyme contains nitrogen. There's the interaction. So, when you're harvesting a 200 bushel per acre corn crop and leaving lots of residue, you're giving the microbes plenty of carbon and now they want nitrogen in order to use it. On the other hand, when you're knifing in anhydrous ammonia and there's not much in the way of residues, you're giving the, the microbes the nitrogen they need and now they want to be able to use it to make energy by burning carbon. If they don't have the residues, they'll know where to look. Sometimes you can put this effect to good purpose. For example, let's suppose you have a tree stump and you don't have a stump grinder. Well, one idea is you can drill out the stump and fertilize it with something called stump remover. It's nothing but a fancy word for fertilizer, potassium nitrate. So you put in that stump remover and then you occasionally water it and you're gonna keep the microbes working for you to rot out the stump. That's what they're gonna do. They'll use the nitrogen to burn the carbon. A few years ago, I set up a demonstration of exactly that with a couple blocks cut out of a piece of pine two by four. I milled some slots in the two blocks and put some soil in as an inoculum. And then one of the stumps, one of the blocks, I gave calcium nitrate to, the other one got no end. And after about six weeks, I took this photo and it was very clear. The, the piece of wood that had gotten fertilized was growing all kinds of fungal colonies. You can't see them very well the, with the lighting here, but this block is covered with fungal growth. This one had almost none. The nitrogen stimulated the microbes to attack the wood. And then, Back in 1989, they had a little problem up in Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska. You might remember this. Um, it was a ship called the Exxon Valdez. And one night it dumped a load of crude oil in Prince William Sound. Man, it was one catastrophe. And the environment, environmentalists were desperate to find a way to get rid of the crude oil and clean it up. One of the things they tried was fertilizer. So here we have a paper that I found from 1991, and they had tried a treatment of using synthetic urea with a phosphorus-based surfactant, and the crude oil in this treated spot here has all been burned away. So the, the nitrogen from the urea stimulated the microbes to attack the crude oil and use it as a source of carbon. It's called bioremediation. 
Then we come back to the moral plots. And now we're comparing continuous corn with the corn oats hay rotation. And we're looking at the two fertility treatments, the unfertilized and the NPK. The figure is showing us the corn yield in what is here kind of a golden color, the residue input represented by this sort of turquoise bar, and then the blue bar representing the fertilizer and applied. So for the unfertilized treatment, no fertilizer applied, there's only two bars, and none of us would be surprised that corn would yield better after alfalfa than when grown continuously. That was the whole point of the old system of farming. You grow the nitrogen with a forage legume. The story here is found on the right side of the figure. There we're looking at the corn yield in years when corn was grown on all the rotations. So this is only using years of all corn. And we find out that the corn yield is substantially higher with the corn oats hay rotation than with continuous corn. Whereas the input of residue was actually greater for the continuous corn and, and so was the input of fertilizer in. So in the three year corn oats hay rotation, we put in less and we got out more. That's the effect of the rotation. And it illustrates a point that used to be made in Moral Plot's papers. And that was that fertilizers cannot replace rotation. Still valid. So we come back to the Moral Plots. In 2006, we had a dry summer in Urbana. And Said and I went out there with, with, with a student of ours. And we're comparing again those same rotations, continuous corn and corn oats hay. What a difference. And we did not Photoshop the figures. It's the same student in both photos. Continuous corn, not looking too good. The corn isn't much higher than the student. But down on the south end, it was a different world. The corn was eight plus feet tall, lush and dark green. What, why would there be such a difference? Well, the why is that the continuous corn got fertilized with nitrogen every year. It burned the soil. Here it was every third year. There's more organic matter on the south end and organic matter stores water. And there's the difference between the two rotations. So we come to the big picture. A big picture addressed by a, an issue of National Geographic in 2008. It has the catchy label, where food begins. Their concern is with soil degradation, and they go into things like acidification, salinization, and other problems, but they left one problem out, and it's the one that's gonna come back to bite us in the butt. And that is that in, in growing much higher yields, in the Green Revolution, we've relied on an artificial approach with synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. And with that development since the 1960s, and I'm thinking of Said over here who saw this himself come into Pakistan, and it had a big effect. 
It did increase the yields. It did increase the food supply, and it did increase the population. It doubled the world population. But now we come to begin to realize, well, we did this in a way that was artificial. We pumped up the production, but by so doing, we promoted the loss of soil organic matter. Oh boy, <laughs> ain't this a fun one. We've got soil degradation problems, and although you can hide a lot of this for a while with other advances like better genetics and higher planting rates, the day will come when the pauper must be paid. And that's a pretty grim outlook. And so food shortages beginning to show up in places like Southeast Asia and India. India's got a problem. They've had to up the end rate in order to maintain the same productivity. The soils are getting weaker. And when Said and I were in the Netherlands, we heard the same story there. They had to up the end rate to keep the yields constant. It's kind of a, an intimidating picture we face. Zero yield stagnating and in some cases declining. So it brings us to the obvious question, what can be done? Well, I'm gonna give you two suggestions, most directed toward the first idea of the short-term strategy, and that would be aimed at improving fertilizer in uptake efficiency. This goes right back to what Kelsey covered in her talk. If we wanna minimize the damage to the soil, we want to put as much of that fertilizer in in the crop as we can. Keep it away from the microbes who would be stimulated by it. So one way of doing that, and, and I think both Kelsey and I would agree on this, but the best way of doing it is to factor in the soil's end supplying power. And this translates into variable rate in. Different soils have different supplies, they need different amounts of fertilizer. So here we see Tim Smith in one of his earlier rigs, uh, and he has a Concord soil sampler mounted on the side of it. He is taking soil samples to make variable rate and recommendations with the ISNT. And that's the approach that has a lot of potential in the Midwest and other humid regions where mineralization is the key to managing in. In drier regions like the Western Great Plains, they don't get the rainfall, they don't have the microbial activity, and there it's more a matter of accounting for profile nitrate accumulation. So it depends on your climate as to how best to, to deal with this. Second idea here, and this ties right back to Kelsey's work, is to optimize the timing of when N is applied. Now we've got this system in the Midwest that's been around for a long time of applying ammonia in the fall for corn six months later. Now that's, that's a prescription for trouble. We're putting ammonia in and the microbes have residues from the previous crop, and they are happy campers. You've given them in, you've given them carbon, they're gonna to go to work. It makes a whole lot more sense agronomically to put the N on when the crop is there to use it. And so we have things like Y drops that have gotten a lot of attention and they do represent potential for improving end management. And then another idea that Kelsey mentioned in her talk was the form of the fertilizer in. And she did a study on this. She talked about it. And I took some of the data from that work to use in, in these two figures. We're comparing potassium nitrate, UAN, and urea. It was applied by Y-drops. 
And we have two years of data here. In both cases, the potassium nitrate gave the highest fertilizer and uptake efficiency. Two reasons for that, and, and, and she mentioned both of these. One is that the potassium nitrate is not prone to volatilize. It's not gonna be lost as a gas. And why drops apply it on the surface, of course. Secondly, the microbes want ammonium. That's what they really want. Nitrate is not to their liking. The crop has the advantage for nitrate. The microbes have the advantage for ammonium. So try and keep the N away from the microbes and get it to the crop. So there's potential in re-examining what kind of fertilizers we use. And I realize there are serious constraints here. Uh, you, you guys know better than I. Anhydrous ammonia, UAN, these are the kind of products that the market is set up to use. Potassium nitrate is not readily available and it's much more expensive, I understand. But just some food for thought, nitrate might give us a way to keep the N in the crop. So then we come to the long-term approach. I won't say much about this because I just don't have many answers that I can really leave you with, but regenerative ag is taking on some really important ground with things like this. It may be that the only real way to sustain crop production and continue the food supply chain is by diversifying agriculture. I'm thinking of a book by Albert Howard, The Soil and Health. And in there, he talks about the need to bring the animals back to the farm, and he says that agriculture will never be sustainable until that is done. He may be right. I don't begin to have the answers as to how to make that practical. It's, it's a daunting challenge but it's one that we need to deal with and take on seriously. One of the aspects too, it is pointed out here with this photo of red clover in Oregon. It's showing us that with a legume crop like that, it reduces our reliance on synthetic N. And synthetic N is the part of the nitrogen supply side that causes the burning of the soil. The legumes don't don't burn the soil because they couple carbon with nitrogen. So I leave you with this quote. Discovered in a cave in northern India and dated back to some 3,500 years ago. It talks about the importance of the soil, <clears throat> of the soil for sustaining humanity. They recognize how important it is to manage the soil, and it's no less important today than it was then. That's my story. <laughs>